Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webcast on the Task Force for Climate Related Disclosures. This is part one of the webcast series where we'll talk about the current state of TCFD among companies before moving on to the more practical action points on how companies can get started. Our speakers for today are Jennifer Saunders, Associate Director from Corporate Citizenship, who will share a little more about how the climate momentum has been growing worldwide, followed by John Mark Zito, Global Director of Environment and Climate Change Impact at Corporate Citizenship, who will present an introduction to the status of TCFD reporting and a roadmap on how to implement the recommendations. In the second and final part of the series, we will discuss scenario analysis. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Saunders from Corporate Citizenship. We are here today because we're, into, we're looking at integrating climate risks and opportunities into long-term business strategy and into financial disclosures, and that's increasing. In fact, it's an expectation, and in some jurisdictions, we are seeing this reporting becoming mandatory. We are seeing institutional investors continue to increase pressure on companies to disclose and measure climate risks. And as, and as recent as two weeks ago, with Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, with his letter to CEOs and letter to clients, we, are so, we saw a call to disclose a plan to achieve net zero by 2050. Climate momentum is growing worldwide, and this is no surprise. In the UK, they have a commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, and they were the first major economy to step up and make that into law. The UK's green finance strategy is requiring companies to disclose alignment to TCFD by 2025. In China, we have one of the world's largest emitters pledging to achieve peak emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. In the EU, we see a pledge for carbon neutrality by 2050 in line with the Paris Accord and of course the EU Green Deal Investment Plan. In New Zealand, it was the first country to establish policies that require companies and financial institutions of a certain size to disclose climate risk. We know both CDP, previously known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, and DJSI, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, have made changes to their corresponding questionnaire and CSA to gain further alignment to TCFD. More and more systems are pointing to TCFD as a leader in approach to reaching carbon reduction goals. So let's look at how our regions are going in terms of setting goals for the future. These are some of the commitments made in the APAC region. Besides the carbon reduction goals varying considerably across the region, the baselines are not easily comparable. These are country level commitments, but they can only be achieved through an effort made by those that can measure, manage, and then go on to avoid, reduce, and switch and offset emissions. We are seeing, along with the country commitments, a strong push for increased disclosure led by APAC stock exchanges. Clear expectations are being set about reporting, especially around disclosure of climate related risk. We're also seeing additional incentives and pressures. More and more countries are moving to net zero. Thank you for that introduction, Jen. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Mark Zuko, and I lead the Environment and Climate Change team. Before we get started, I guess for those of you new to TCFD, there's probably a few things which is useful to know to put it into context. Um, firstly, the intended audience. So it's for investors, it's for lenders, it's for insurance underwriters. So um, what the TCFD recommendations are there to do is to provide information about climate impact to those capital providers. So they can consider climate change when valuing companies. Um, so what we're, they're going to be interested in uh, will be metrics to allow comparison between those organizations. Um, they're also going to be interested in understanding that the foundation has been put in place around governance and risk management and they're going to want to understand the impact of climate um, climate to the business and when we talk in tcfd terms that impact is financial impact um, the second thing to mention is um, the tcfd is less about your impact to the climate and more about how climate change impacts the organization in financial terms so to understand that, you need to be able to look into the future 
and we use climate scenarios to be able to determine what that future could look like. Um, and then lastly, this is a company-wide issue. So it's not something which can sit within a sustainability department. To be able to respond to these disclosures, you need to be able to get board buy-in. You need to be able to engage with corporate finance, investor relations, comms, sustainability team, risk management. Um, and so that engagement piece at the beginning of any TCFD project is going to be key. So here we have the 11 recommendations across four pillars. And rather than trying to cover all of these recommendations, I'm going to concentrate on the strategy pillar. And that's where the climate scenario analysis takes place. And that's where we begin to try and understand the impacts from risks and opportunities to the organization. What sits behind these very broad recommendations? Um, the first one is um, to describe climate related risks and opportunities over the short, medium, and long term. So the first component here. Um, are the time horizons. And typically what we're seeing is there's some standardization uh, as to what short, medium and long term actually um, represents. So short is typically uh, naught to one year, medium is one to five years, and long term is five to 40 years. So in that way, you can break up that long term climate scenario. The next thing you need to be able to think about is how do you map your organization to that time horizon. So what relevance does it have to your organization? Um, one way to do that is to think about the average lifetime of your assets, products, and services. The other thing is to think about your internal financial forecasts. So how far in the future do your, does your financial planning forecast? So for example, um, if you're forecasting diesel prices, or if you're forecasting carbon prices, do you need to think about extending those forecasts? The next thing is to describe your climate related risks and opportunities. And the first thing to think about is in the TCFD reports, they have a TCFD typology. So they basically categorized um, physical risks into acute and chronic and transition risks into policy and legal market, reputation, and technology. And by assigning your risks and opportunities to those categories, it allows the audience, the, the investors or other stakeholders to be able to compare between companies. Um, the next thing to do is think about how specific you can be about these risks and opportunities. And investors are very interested in how different combinations of geography and sector will have its own characteristics, both in terms of physical risks and local climate policy. So being specific about how these risks and opportunities map to those geography sector combinations across your value chain is really important. So you need to be in depth. The next thing is about opportunities. So if you can align those to SDGs, um, that is a helpful thing to do. And then lastly, thinking about the relationship between risks and opportunities. So the next um, recommendation is to describe your impact on business strategy and financial planning. So this is about your short list of most material risks and opportunities. And when we're talking about materiality in TCFD terms, we're talking about financial impact. So how material is the financial impact? And to do that, you need to be able to quantify the financial impact. So often when we're talking about TCFD, we talk about climate scenario analysis, that can be done qualitatively, and then it can also be done quantitatively. Um, <clears throat> and, and when we're talking about financial impact, we're, we're trying to understand the relationship, the cause and effect, um, the pathway, whatever you want to call it, between a risk, an opportunity, and how the operations, um, how, how the organization's cash flow looks. So you're looking at committed capex, you're looking at costs, and you're looking at revenues. Now, different sectors will describe the impact to your cash flows in different ways. So, for example, banks looking at their loan book will be wanting to look at the climate adjusted probability of default in repaying those loans. Um, in contrast, a mining company may just be uh, may just want to understand the contribution to the net present value. So you need to be able to justify the metrics you're using to be able to disclose that view. Next, uh, you need to be able to describe how you're managing that impact. And here we're basically talking about the relationship between 
um, climate impacts and your financial planning. So in financial planning, you'll have different growth forecasts. You may have future strategies for your portfolio of products and services, um, and you may have different um, projections of committed capex for mitigation and adaptation. Now, all of those components within your financial planning will impact your calculations of financial impact. So here, what we want to be able to do is make sure that those that financial planning model, which is already in place, is talking to and is inputting into your modeling. Um, and by understanding how each of those components interact, allows you to be able to describe how you're managing that impact. Lastly, um, we have scenario analysis and resilience. So basically, you need to be able to justify what pathways you're looking at. So um, in addition to your aggressive mitigation scenario, are you also looking at a middle of the road and a high global warming scenario? And why have you selected those? Um, what data are you using? And what assumptions sit in those scenarios? And then finally, the results of that scenario analysis. And then lastly, um, the resilience of the strategy. So what decisions have you taken in the last 12 months which demonstrates that you are strengthening your strategy against these climate change impacts. So that could be simply adjusting your processes and systems to be able to better consider climate change and better integrate it into the business. Alternatively, it could be about decarbonizing your portfolio by increasing your capital expenditure on mitigation. Um, and lastly, it could be about um, producing new innovative low carbon uh, solutions. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what sits beneath these broad recommendations and what you need to consider. So in the last three years, the TCFD um, have produced these really useful status reports and they give you a really good view of the global perspective on how organizations are responding to these recommendations. So they use um, AI and they basically look at all the disclosures um, from 1,700 companies over the last three years across 63 countries. Um, and on the right, you can see the results of that analysis. So the first thing to say is that 42% um, of companies in 2019 are disclosing against all of the recommendations. So um, there's, there's real momentum behind the TCFD. But what we're also seeing is that different recommendations have different, very different levels of disclosure. So, for example, um, resilience of strategy and integration of climate risk and opportunities into the risk map, sorry, climate risk into risk management systems are both quite low. And I think the reasoning behind that is companies are going through a process. They're beginning to think about understanding a process for identifying risk and opportunities and assessing those risk and opportunities. And they're not yet at the stage to understand, okay, the outcome of that analysis, how do we adjust our strategy to, to, to um, accommodate um, the results of that analysis? So I think that's going to increase with time. The other thing to mention is that in terms of where companies are disclosing, it's in the main still in sustainability reports. So it's four times more likely to see TCFD disclosures in sustainability reports as opposed to mainstream financial filings. And what we're typically seeing is a one page in the annual report and then all the content and detail within the sustainability report or in a standalone TCFD report. And then on the left, um, they did a, a really useful engagement with um, some expert users and, and asked those investors, what do you find most useful in disclosures for financial decisions? And um, the metrics piece is really important because that allows them to be able to compare between companies um, and also being able to understand the impact of those climate risks to an organization, both by geography and by sector. So when thinking about implementation, thinking about, okay, well, what does a roadmap look like to be able to begin disclosing against these recommendations? On the left is what are you already doing in your carbon management program, which maps to the recommendations? And so you, might have, you may have a scope one and two carbon footprint. You may have carbon reduction targets. Um, you may have climate change within your risk register. And you may have plans to be able to meet those targets. And that allows you to be able to build a resilience story. And you may have board responsibility assigned. So all these things 
can be mapped to the recommendations are a good starting place to be able to understand where your gaps are. After that gap analysis and you understand um, what you need to be able to do to be able to close those gaps, the next thing you need to think about is um, the order of play. So how are you going to prioritise those things you need to be able to do? And one useful way to look at this is to think about what information is most useful to your stakeholders and to your investors. Um, and on the right, you can see this progression from foundation to additions. Um, and this is in the status report. So what they, what they advise is prioritise by what's most useful. And the first thing they suggest, this is indicative, is you look at the foundation. So make sure that you've got the governance process in place, make sure you've got the risk management process in place. Then you look at the enhancement. So establishing that baseline, so putting your scope one and two emissions in place and identifying those material climate issues. And that can be done in a qualitative way. And then addition. So begin thinking about how to model your climate scenario analysis and quantify the financial impact. And also think about current and future regulatory requirements in the different regions you operate. And also moving into understanding the impacts in your value chain, so your scope three emissions, but also James is going to be talking about alignment metrics as well. What we look here is um, the, the full um, approach we'd take is to go towards full disclosure, so both qualitative and quantitative climate scenario analysis. A lot of companies want to start off with this TCFD readiness review, so this is the gap analysis to understand how they sit against these recommendations where the gaps are and what they need to be able to do uh, to do to close those gaps. Phase two is about uh, going through a process to be able to review the different climate change scenarios and agree with the organization which is most suitable. So um, out of that middle of the road and high global warming and aggressive mitigation, what is the view we're gonna be looking at? Once that's decided, we can then um, supplement that information with sector specific and regional local climate change policy to be able to get a view a long list of risks and opportunities and at that point um, this next stage is really important we engage with the different business functions within the organization to understand the relevance of those risks and opportunities and the potential magnitude of impact and that gives us a short list of risks and opportunities um, and at that point we are in a good position to be able to disclose against the recommendation so we can talk about um, the gaps we're going to address and the roadmap to be able to do that. We can talk about the process we've gone through to select the scenarios. We can describe those scenarios and we can talk about the most material risks and opportunities from that qualitative review. The next stage is then thinking about how to quantify um, the most material risks and opportunities. So we go back to understanding that pathway um, between risks and um, impact to the cash flows and we can build the model to be able to understand that better and then importantly we overlay different futures of the business onto that model so for example different um, reduction targets and different development cases so your base case and your business development case and by overlaying those different futures we can begin to understand how resilient the strategy is um, and, and begin to build the narrative around that in phase four, we think about how to take that analysis and turn it into useful metrics and targets, which James is going to talk about. And then finally, in phase five, um, we make sure the organization is able to undertake that analysis on an ongoing basis. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you found part one of the webcast series on TCFD recommendations useful. In the second part, we will be covering climate scenario analysis.